I was in love when my heart grew colder. You took control and I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. Who could have known that our hearts so broken? It's beating alive and it's all because you're new. It's all because you're new. You're all I wanna know, all I wanna think, all I wanna wanna sing your praise. Can't stop love you.
reality of Christian church. And we are so very excited that you have chosen to be a part of our worship experience. Whether you are joining us in person here in our facility or whether you're joining us online, we are so glad that you are choosing to be a part of our worship You know, worship is such a vital part of the Christian life, the Christian journey. Uh, worship kind of puts things into perspective because what we put on that top shelf, what we what we place up there to worship, what we say, this is this is really important to me, this is really important to this world, what we place as the object or the philosophy of worship is so vital. And as a church, we put God in that position. And so each and every week, we come into this place just to worship who he is and to worship what he is doing and to worship what he has done in our life throughout the course of the week. So we're, we're asking that you just get yourself ready. Get yourself ready for what God is about to do this morning. We hope that you'll join us right now as you come in from the lobby, as you get yourself ready, you prepare yourself, that you start to think, okay, i got to get my mind and my heart ready, not only to give worship, but to receive what God has for us today. Morning, Valley View. If you would, be standing. Let's begin our morning of praise together. All you out in the lobby, we're starting without you. All of you at home, we see you. Join us. This is the day that 
you have made Whatever comes, I won't complain For all my hope is in your name And now your joy awaits my praise Lift it up, church I give thanks You can definitely clap. Y'all can have a seat now. Well, good morning. Happy Sunday to you. And I think we should just take a moment for these folks behind us here that lead us in worship every Sunday, the ones on the cameras and the little glass room up there. Just give them a round of applause because they put a lot of work into helping us. So thank y'all. I'm seeing a lot of smiles this morning. It's hard not to smile the week after Easter, isn't it? You just kind of walk around with a smile on your face. Well, we're glad you're here because this is a place to be because this is where we remember the Savior, Jesus. He put the smiles on our faces, right? It's because of him we have a smile. So it's important we gather to do that. Folks online, we see you. We're glad you're with us as well. Tani, LaShawn, everyone out there, glad you're joining us. And if this is your first time here or maybe you were here last weekend and you thought you'd come back and just check this out one more time, welcome. We're really glad you're here. If you get a second, we would really appreciate it. There's a card in front of you called the Connect Card. If you'd fill that out, we just want to know you were here and learn a little bit about you. You can do that online. You can scan that code, in fact. If you scan that code in front of you or on the screen for folks online, you'll be able to do that as well. We just want to be able to say hi to you. If you fill out the card, we'll bribe you. We're not above it. There's a gift out for you in the foyer. So just stop and drop it off. And It may be a car. I don't know. Okay, maybe not. 
but it's something that shows we appreciate you and we're glad you're here with us. So take that time to do that if you would. Listen, every Sunday, um, if you're here regular, you know we do this. If you're visiting, we do this every Sunday. This is our chance to just stop and give thanks and give back. It's a time of offering. Everything we had this week, whatever you're sitting with right now, God gave it to you. And part of our worship is we give a portion back. So we make it easy. You can go to vvcc.org backslash give. Do it online. Um, you can do old-fashioned and put it in an envelope. There's a drop box just, out the, just as you're leaving here. You'll see the silver box. Just drop it in there, however you want to do it. Um, but it's just a good time, right? It centers you again. Just to know that it's not us, it's God. And we just worship him. And he says to do this, so we do it every Sunday. So please take a moment to do that. And then if you'd stand, I just want to take a, a moment before we get singing again. So go ahead and stand up. We want to greet each other. And listen, I think you ought to ask the people next to you if they have any Easter candy left. <laughs> and more importantly, will they share it with you? That's the important part. God is up to something good here. We serve a God that is good, and he works all things together for our good. Amen? When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. When I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. And when I'm
So let me ask you this morning, church, as that song said, what are we waiting for, <laughs> right? It says, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then it sings back to you. It says, so what are we waiting for, right? The presence of God is already in this room, right? Our hearts are open to him. Right? And, that's, and that's the question this morning. What are we waiting for? Right, and the response that we should sing is, let's just praise the Lord together. Amen? Amen? So I want to challenge you there with that this morning. And don't let anything get in the way of you just praising him this morning. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let anything hinder you. Man, when, when we sing that song, the very first line, give thanks to the Lord. It's straight from scripture. His love endures forever. Right? You can read that on your own. But I love the question, so what are we waiting for? Am I waiting for God to move? Am I waiting for the person next to me to move? Am I waiting, me, am I waiting for someone up here to move? Because we, we can't make that decision for you, right? That needs to be my response, right? That's why I love the, the psalm. And I remind myself this every morning. Enter his courts with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Every morning. Right, when I drive up in to, to, to church every morning, that's the first thing that comes into my mind as I walk into this room. Is I want to enter his courts with praise. I want to give thanksgiving when I'm in here. All right, so what are we waiting for? I want you to think about that. As we continue to worship, I want us to read Ephesians together and it says this. It says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. My response to that has to be praise. My response to that has to be a song. I can't wait any longer 
right? I have to sing about the goodness of God this morning, right? You have to sing about that, right? We celebrated last week, but it, it has to be an every single day thing, right? Because let me tell you, once you understand how, how I thought about it this way, actually. Uh, like in basketball, you know how the players have a wingspan? And I thought about it being God's love is so big that I can't, his, his wingspan, it never stops. It just keeps going. All right, that, that's how much he loves us. It just keeps going. So again, I'm going to tell you what are we waiting for. All right, let's just praise him this morning. Let's sing about his goodness. Let's sing about his love. Don't let anything stop you. All right, because the word of God said, where there are two or three in his name that he is there. All right, if you look around you, there's more than that today. So let's praise him this morning. Come on. We give them everything today. We sing. And all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness. Oh God, 
more we sing today, we lift it up this morning. Come on. In all my life, you have been faithful. You gotta lift up your voice this morning. Come on, sing all my life. And all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. Every prayer that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. Come on, sing one more time. All my life. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing. Goodness of God. Come on, we sing today. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. She's running out, she's running out. On. That is the love of God right there. That it keeps running and keeps running and keeps going after you. Its arms are wide open. But I want to give you an opportunity this morning. There's a line that says that I surrender now. That I choose to surrender now. It says I, I choose to give you everything. Not partially. I don't put one foot in. It says I choose to give you everything. So if you've never done that. Let me just tell you, if you've never done that, your life will change drastically if you choose to give him everything. It will cost you. But let me tell you, walking with God is such a beautiful thing. I remember Pastor Joe said at one time that when you, when you choose to say yes to Jesus, it doesn't mean that your problems are going to go away in a second. But that you're no longer walking alone. That you're with that someone is with you every single moment, every single day. So I want to invite you, why don't you just close your eyes for a second. And I want you to open up your hands. And I'm going to pray with us today. But if you've never chosen to give God everything, and maybe you're a believer, but it's different when you choose to say, God, I'm going to give you everything. My life, my song, my journey, my desires, the, the, the things that I want to do, I'm going to give you everything. So I want you to just meditate for a second. I want you to think of saying yes to Jesus today and choosing to give him everything. So, Father, we give you everything that is in us today. Father, from, from our, our biggest worries to the smallest things, Father, the anxiety, Father, the depression, whatever it is, our, our hope, our fear, our joy, we give you everything that is in us today, in this moment, right now.
We choose to give you everything because you are the one that, that holds it all together, Father. You are the one that can have made things new. You are the one that is doing something good. Father, so we choose to give you everything. Father, our, our lives, our, our hearts, Father, our families, Father, we give it all to you today. Because we want to experience the goodness of God. Father, we want to experience what you have for us today. And we will never experience it fully if we hold on to the past. If we hold on to our, the things that we want to do, if we, if we hold on to our tradition, Father, we give it all to you. Father, would you work in us today? Would you change something in our hearts today, right now, in this moment? Lord, we love you, we thank you. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated this morning. Hey, well, don't you love just being in church together and being able to worship, right? It's an awesome opportunity that we get to do every week, and I'm so glad to see each and every one of you. If you have your Bible, I want you to pull that out real quick, and if you have a favorite app, you can pull that up on your phone or whatever you have with you, your tablet, whatever you have. And I just want to share with you at the beginning, man, God is at work here in Valley View. You may be able to see it. Some of you may, may this may be your first week here, and you're, you're like, okay, I don't, I'm not really sure if that's God or not, but we'll, we'll find out. But uh, I know this, that God is at work here in a lot of different, lot of different areas, a lot of different arenas. And a matter, matter of fact, God was at work last weekend, um, and we had a chance last weekend at Easter just to respond. We got to see people respond to God at work, right? And there were some things that happened on, on Good Friday night as we got gathered together and went through some stations of the cross. And then Saturday morning, man, there was this ginormous Easter egg hunt out outside and kids were having a lot of fun and I saw a lot of dads stealing kid candy from their kids and all that taking place. But then 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 we, we also see God at work in, in other areas. Like uh, about 18 months ago, I stood up here and I, I asked you for a half a million dollars. And uh, God has been working very consistently in your life and in the life of the church and we're about 92% of, our, of the way there. So that's pretty amazing. And uh, we, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say this for before summer gets here, if you could help us out finish and help up that uh, last few dollars there of, of half a million, uh, that sounds like an awful lot to me. But uh, I know God can do work in your life, and then God will bless this church and continue to do so. But there was a, another opportunity that we had and to see God at work, and I, I think it was my, my favorite part of last weekend, and that was when we went from this room outside into God's bigger room, right? And we got to watch people give their life, and they responded to the work that God had been working on in their life. And they responded to that in such a way that they, they decided to give their life away. And they decided to, to say yes to Jesus being both Lord and Savior, both men and women and children. There's some pictures of all that taking place, and, and they, they were baptized last week. And if you weren't here, man, you missed out. And uh, I know this, that some of you are still thinking through that and you're still trying to, to understand just exactly how God is working in you. And maybe you need to have a conversation. We'll talk about that a little bit more a, a little bit later. But that's a great segue into what we're doing now. We, on this side of the resurrection, on this side of Easter Sunday, uh, we're, we're going to do a sermon series entitled A Righteous Life. And I know what some of you are thinking like when you, can, when you just consider that word, not the word life, but the word righteous, some of you are very dismissive right away. Some of you are like, wow, I, I'm going to distance myself from that word because that's not the life I live. That's not the life I represent. That's not, that's not the life that I even 
I'm not even trying to pursue that kind of life. I don't, I don't see myself in that way. That's a standard that God set for himself. That's a standard that is unattainable for me. I don't know as if I can get there. We, we just need to talk about what it means to live a, a righteous life after a resurrected life. And so today, here's what I want to ask this question of you. What, just, just do your best while you're sitting there with your own mind. What, what is a righteous life? Try, try to come up with a definition. And, and as you're asking yourself, it, as you get some definition to that word, to those words, is, is that the pursuit of your life? Are, are you actually striving to live a righteous life? What is a righteous life? Man, that is, that, that is a really difficult term to define. Maybe in its most simplest form, you, you might say this, a righteous life is just a, a life that is right with God in, in its most simple form. Like any person who is le- literally living their life in alignment with the standards that God has for us and the responsibilities that God has given to us. Like when, when you align your life with the standards that God sets, listen, it, righteousness becomes the reason for everything in your life, it becomes the reason for you to live in this world. And as Christians, you and I, we, we believe that, you know, obviously God is the standard. And we look at God and we think, oh, I, I can't be that. And some, some of us would, I think some of us in this room, when you, when you start to define righteousness, you're, you're thinking about words like morally acceptable behavior. But biblically, it's much more than that. Biblically, those, those who are righteous are those who are acceptable to God because God has made it possible for you to be righteous. And your life is aligned with his. Like to be righteous is to be right with God. And righteousness is something that you and I, you and I are called to pursue. We can't just set that aside. We, we're called to live this righteous life in our character and in our actions and, and in our attitudes and in our, in our words. Years ago, I, I met a young man. I was living in another state and I was doing ministry at another church. And um, I met Andrew. His name's Andrew. And, uh, and Andrew came to church for two reasons. Number one, he came to church because his girlfriend came to our church. And so he was going to follow her there because he wanted to be spend time with her. But the second reason that Andrew came to the church was he literally wanted to debate and debunk the Christian life. He told me that. First day, first moment, first words out of his mouth. The only reason I'm here is to prove what you believe to be false. And the reason he believed that was his parents were, were both atheists and they were antagonists toward Christ, the Christian life. They, they, were, they, were, they had so many initials after their names. They were educated beyond belief, his parents. And they they could not see, because of their education, they could not see how anyone could ever believe that Jesus could rise from the dead. They couldn't get over that. They, They could not come to the conclusion that anyone could ever believe in Jesus in any way, shape, or form. And and literally, the more that Andrew engaged in In the study of of God's word, the more frequently his visits to the church began to happen. And he he started to literally, you can watch it happen. He started to come around, not just physically, but he started to come around spiritually. God was working in him. And Andrew was one of the sharpest young men I've ever met. He was a brilliant, brilliant thinker. And his questions were always deep and thought-provoking. And you could tell that as God was working in him, he was looking for a meaning and a purpose for his life. And he, he, he'd ask questions. I could, you, you could just see it going on in his mind. Could Christianity really be true? Could Jesus really be alive? Could, can, can I trust what it is that I, I'm finding myself slowly believing? His relationship with his girlfriend soon faded away. He quickly outgrew her in faith. And it was interesting because his connection with God and God's people continued to to grow even 
at a greater pace. And if I could say this about Andrew, Andrew started to know who Jesus is. He started to really fully grasp that in his, in his life. And eventually he surrendered his life and his beliefs and he was immersed into this life-giving name of Jesus. For the forgiveness of his sins and you know, he, he, he was buried in the waters of baptism. And he was raised to walk a new life. As he moved through his high school years, he, he realized that, hey, I'm going to give up. He, he went home and he told his parents, hey, listen, I'm going to give up my full ride scholarship in the area of philosophy and debate. I want to go to Bible college and study the word of God. His family was very antagonistic towards me at that point, and, but Andrew became very, very proficient in an area called apologetics, which landed him a, a job. He would eventually get married, have children, and he became a professor at a, at a university in the area of theology. And, and then he, he would do that during the week, and then he would go preach at a, a church on the weekends. And o- over, over time, his, he was getting closer. We, I, we thought he was getting closer and closer to Jesus, but over time, over a specific amount of time, Andrew took his eyes and his heart off the prize. He, he took his eyes off of Jesus. And in the privacy of a single moment, in the privacy of an inner desire, that desire became public quickly. And all of a sudden, his words and his actions didn't line up with his beliefs. And it was costly for Andrew. He, he lost his position as a professor. His marriage was then on shaky ground. And even his friends and those who were following him so closely because he was, a, he was very, very good at convincing people to follow Jesus. They started to distance themselves. And his parents and his sibling, his youngest sibling, they started to point the finger at him. And they said, we told you so. Christians aren't who they claim to be. Jesus isn't who he says he he is. Matter of fact, they pointed the finger at him one day when I was in his presence, and they said, you're just like everyone else. Andrew had misplaced his focus and And for just a single solitary moment, just one small moment, probably didn't even last 30 seconds to a minute, he he misplaced. His mind wasn't where it should have been. And I remember our conversation that we had following all that. The tears that were rolling down his face and the heartbreak that he, he was suffering because he knew that he was being torn apart. And all of the pain and all the apology and all the contrition. And, and then he, he turned to me and he said, Joe, I, I just got, I got caught thinking about what's here and now. I guess he said, I guess my mind was no longer set on the right thing. My, my life is no longer right with God. Most of us. Let me just say it this way. Most Christians live a divided life rather than a crucified life. Perhaps the hardest thing about following Jesus is to live a life that's right with the Father. And the difficulty that you and I have in living a life like that with one foot in this world and one foot in that world, we live a divided life. Listen, the the science of the mind, the study of psychology, has a term for it. The term is cognitive dissonance. It's it's the phrase that psychologists use to describe a phenomenon inside us that most of us encounter regularly, if not daily. It was a theory that was developed in 1950 by a social psychologist by the name of uh, Leon Fedinger. And... Here's what he basically said. Cognitive dissonance is 
is, is this natural drive that you and I have just to, just to be consistent. That your, your belief systems have to be consistent with themselves, but they also have to be consistent with what you say and do and think. But when that consistency doesn't happen, when that consistency doesn't happen, we don't always live what we say we believe and that causes the tension inside of us to build and then that causes a, a conflict to arise and that distress that's welling up within us is called dissonance. And you know how it works. We end up saying one thing when we believe something completely different. And cognitive dissonance is... It's, it's common in everyone. We, we believe one thing, but we completely live another way. We live in the state of having inconsistent thoughts and actions and beliefs. And our, our mind gets redirected. But God has created you and I so that in such a way that when we place our faith and trust and confidence in Jesus, he wants our actions and our thoughts and our words to line up with those beliefs. It's a righteous life. A righteous life is those who live right with God. And so that's the question of our series. How, how do I live that way? How do I live a righteous life? Because I, I do pretty good at living the divided life. But how, how do I live this righteous life? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us some insight. Just a little bit of insight in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, if you have it. And here's what the Apostle says. Speaking to a church a lot like ours. He says this, since then you have been raised with Christ. In other words, you've been immersed in the baptistry. You've been, you've been raised up out of that water. You have been raised with Jesus. Then he says this, how do I live a righteous life? Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Like, think about it this way. The starting point of, of every journey, spiritual journey, begins with knowing who Jesus Christ is. And it's at that point that we put our faith and our trust and our confidence in, in, in that Easter message from last week. That we, we make statements like this. We actually believe that Jesus rose from the dead. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And, and you know this as well, that with, as with every other type of journey that people get on in life, the journey of living this crucified life will have a lot of obstacles. The biggest one me being probably that you think that you can do it on your own, that you have enough willpower, that you have enough strength to live this crucified life on your own. But there's a strength that comes from Jesus Christ that makes this Christian journey successful. Because success in the Christian life is not automatic. You, you have to start cultivating those new seeds that have been planted in you. As soon as you come up out of the water, you got to start cultivating that stuff. Your will has to be surrendered to the will of God. You're you, you have to become Christian through and through every part of your being. You, the heavenly treasures that exist, you have to strive for them. You have to seek those things that are above and put to death those things that will hold you back from living a righteous life. Here's what I've noticed about us, though. Far too many of us, are we're just satisfied with the status quo. Too many of us never really press into the life that God intended us to live. And far too many of us are just satisfied with being, being a Christian rather than doing the things God wants us to do. When the goal of our Christian life, our, the objective from Scripture is that you, God says, hey, I want you to finish the race. 
Listen, many people begin, but very few cross the finish line. So what, what is the secret to pressing on and what, wh- where's the strength to endure this race to the very end? How do I live this righteous life? You, you realize this, that Christ's victory over death to the early Christians was, was everything to them. Like the resurrection meant everything to them. Like Christ rising from the dead, yeah, it was an amazing thing, but it became this joy-filled wonder in their life. It became this foundation and this fountain that, that flowed out of them in every aspect of their life, no matter what condition they found themselves. It supplied the evidence The resurrection supplied the evidence for their convictions of believing, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. Matter of fact, there were some witnesses to that resurrection that helped cause it to be infallible in their minds. It was actually witnessed to by the Holy Spirit that was evident that Jesus said, when you are giving your life to me, I will fill you with my spirit. The resurrection of of Jesus Christ became to the first Christians Literally, it was the reason for everything about their life. And and you know this, the battle cry of those early Christians was this, he is risen. It it became their courage, it became their resolve, it became their purpose. It literally became everything to them. Like the first 200 years of Christianity, hundreds of thousands of people died as martyrs over that fact that Jesus had risen from the dead. And to those early Christians, think about this. Easter was not a holiday. It wasn't even a holy day. It was not a day at all. It was a day that God had used, that God had accomplished something that caused them to live it out all year long. And it became the reason for their daily conduct. He lives, they said. Then you have this, because he lives, I get to live. You just sang about it. Because he lives, I I get to live. And Jesus was triumphant in the resurrection. And in Jesus, you and I are victorious in this life. And Jesus is with us and Jesus leads us. And because he is with us and because he leads us, you and I are called to follow him. And they lived this new life because Jesus had simply been raised from the dead. They, they didn't celebrate his rising from the dead and then go back to their everyday lives. They didn't wait all year long for a single day to happen so that they could clean up some of the mess that was in their life from the, the following year, previous year. They, they lived out the fact that Christ had risen from the dead and they also lived out the fact that they had been raised with Jesus. That's why Paul said, since then, you, you, as a believer in Jesus, you have been raised with Christ. Paul declares that when Christ rose from the dead, his people rose with him. He, he reiterates that in Romans chapter 6 and Ephesians chapter 2. And, and because he lives, you and I get to live free. And because he lives, Paul said, therefore, set your mind on things above. Well, what does Paul mean by that? Set your mind on things above. Like that, That's not some just broadly generalized statement that Paul makes. Hey, you, you should have your head in the clouds the whole time. No, the things that are above, you can identify them. If you would just sit down and think about them, you can identify them. You, we could literally draw a line right down the middle of your life. And we could put on the left-hand side all of the things of this earth. And then on the right-hand side, you could put all of the things that are of heaven. Like, like the things that are of earth, those are the things that, that deal with your sight and your senses and your reasoning. But the things that are in heaven, the things that are above, are your faith and your trust and your confidence in who God is. The, the things that are on earth or of the earth, they, they're the pleasures of this earth. The things that are in heaven are the things that we, we delight in the Lord with. On, on the left, you have the treasures of this earth. 
like fortune and fame and finances. But on the right hand side, you have the treasures that exist that moth and rust cannot destroy. The things that cannot be taken from you. On the left hand side, by contrast, on, on the left you see how we, we go after the, the, our reputation. We want to be liked and we want to be known and we want to be seen. And on the right, we want to be known by God. We want to have a right standing with him. Over on the left-hand side, many of us here on this earth, we, we, want, we want a fancy house and a big house and a big dwelling place. But on the right-hand side, we have this mansion that's being prepared for us. On the left, we want to have the best of friends and the best of company, and we want to have all of these things where people speak kindly of us. But on the right-hand side, we, we just want to be friends with God. And on, on the left-hand side, you, you might find people who follow the philosophies of men. But on the right-hand side, you, you find people who want to follow the, the Word of God. On the left-hand side, you, you find people who are these things that are cultivating in the flesh, and, but on the right-hand side, you, you find those things that are developed by the Spirit of God living within you. On the left-hand side, you, you find these things that, well, I'm just looking forward to this one moment in time. But over here on the right, you're looking forward to eternity, where there is no time. And by contrast, we seek very quickly how different we are called to be as Christians. To set our mind on things above. On the left, we find out really quickly that you, you mostly deal with the sight and sound and reasons that you have. And that's how you do most things. They give you pleasures of this earth. And they make you want the treasures of this earth. And they entice you to want a good reputation and to have a right standing and a rich dwelling place and a big house. And they make you want to walk with a certain crowd and follow man's philosophies. But on the right hand side. The things that are of God, they are found in your faith and in your trust and in your confidence in him. And they make us delight in the Lord and they, we start to value the treasures that are far above us and they encourage us to stand with God and we await those things in heaven and they, they encourage us to walk with him and follow his word and look forward to a day. And, and Paul writes to these Christians to address the mistake that you and I always are making. We know better. But we're always confusing the world with Christianity. Matter of fact, we're trying to get the world to do what we have a hard time getting Christians to do. We're always preaching sermons and writing lessons and singing songs about trying to equate this world with with the church. And it, it literally can't be, be done because the church, God's people are, are completely set apart from that. Because it's not black or white or red or yellow. It's not, it's not about being American or African or Asian or Central or South American. No, the, the, Christian, the Christian church is just this new creation that's been born out of the Holy Spirit living within us. It's a completely different race altogether. It's, it's, a, it's a race where it's a people group called to be completely different than all those around us because we have been risen with Jesus. And because we have been risen with Jesus, Paul says, no, you should seek the things that are above and you should set your mind on the things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That, that should be the heart of our life. That should be the endeavor of our life. And the scriptures teach us that Christ came up out of the grave and he's now for alive forevermore. And he's constantly present with those of us who believe in him. Like wherever the people of God gathered, he's there. We, we therefore minister in his name. And we pray in his name. And we worship in his name. And, and the church of Christ lives because Christ lives. And because he has risen from the grave, you and I have been risen with him, and you and I need to seek those things that are above. Paul gives those two imperatives, the word seek and the word set. 
Seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the things that are above. Put off your old ways. Start to forgive this world. Start to dedicate your life to Jesus. But far too often, I think, here's what we do. We give God the remnants of our time. We don't give him everything that we could, even though he has given all that he has. And some of us even give him only the leftovers of our money and our time. And Scripture tells us, no, give yourself fully to, to Jesus, who gave us his all. Because all that he has given us is all that we have. And therefore, you and, I, you and I need to have a Christian mind. And our difficulty is that you and I are divided. We have a secular mind and a spiritual mind. We have, we have the secular mind where we do most everything that we do in life. And then we have this little bitty tiny part we call the spiritual mind. And with our spiritual mind, we try to serve God just enough. And it doesn't work that way. The, the Christian should always have no secular mind at all. Like, if you're a Christian, you should seek the things that are above. There should be no worldly mind in you at all. And, and living this crucified life kind of disqualifies that di divided life. A, a life that's partly secular and partly spiritual, partly of this world and partly of the world above, that's not what the New Testament teaches at all. No, the, the righteous life the, the righteous life is focused on conducting your life that re reflects the lordship of Jesus over you. And the righteous life is you being acceptable to God because God has made it possible for you to live a righteous life. Whether you're at work or at home or at school or wherever you find yourself. Like in all of your relationships, some of them when you're alone, some of them when you're corporately with the church. The, the righteous life is literally to have the mind of Christ that like the thoughts of Christ occupy your thoughts and the, 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 the motives of Christ are your motives and the interests of Christ become your interests. Paul said it this way, to live is, is Christ. To live is Christ. And Christ has risen and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And we're to live as if heaven is our home. I was thinking about that concept and how I could re relay that information to you. And I, I thought about it this way, that a, a country boy who comes to the city will act completely different because he belongs on the farm. And a city boy who goes to the country will act completely different. Because he belongs in the city. See, the, the, man who, the man who has not been on a farm will walk around really gingerly trying not to get his shoes dirty. Because he doesn't want to carry that mud home. As Christians, you and I need to act that way. We don't want to carry that home. We, we belong up there. Our dwelling is up there, above, where Christ is seated. And our thinking needs to belong up there as well because everything about a believer belongs up there. And the difficulty is we feel more at home down here. And I suppose, I was thinking about this. One day I saw one of the strangest things I've ever seen in my life. Years ago, we were crossing this bridge in the northeast and the, the river underneath the bridge was completely frozen. And when I looked down onto the water, what was the frozen, the frozen ice, there was this eagle that was about this tall, bald eagle. And he was walking across the river. And I thought to myself, wow, that's just one of the strangest things ever to watch it, to see an eagle walking on the ground, making his way across a frozen piece of ice. But at the same time, once he got to where he wanted to go, he decided to lift off the ground and to soar. 
And one of the most graceful things I've ever seen in my life was an eagle who spread his wings and flew through the sky. And I suppose we act awkward in this world because we belong to another world. I don't know if you've ever noticed this about conversations that can happen in various settings. Maybe perhaps you're weak where you're surrounded by people who are not Christians. And you don't easily fit into their conversations. And you, you start to act awkwardly and you get a little worried and ashamed and you start to wonder, why don't I fit in? Well, it's because you don't belong here. It's because you belong to God. You, you have another spirit that speaks another language. And when you speak the world's language, you speak it with an accent. This week I had to go to court. Not because I had done anything wrong. I had to do some business for the church. And the language of court is so different. They use words like you've never heard before. And here I was listening to the judge and the attorney talk, and then all of a sudden the attorney starts talking to me, and he knew that I was a pastor. He knew that I worked at a church, and he knew what I did for a living. And so he tries to talk Christian to me. And I felt pretty bad for him <laughs> because he tried to act like he knew Jesus. And when some people try to speak Jesus, they speak as if they know him. But they speak with an accent. They belong to this earth, and, but Christians belong to the God in heaven. And, and of course there's going to be a language barrier. And our job is to help them see. And people will think you walk awkwardly down here, but literally they've not seen you with your wings spread. Well, you're ready to soar and ready to meet God in all his glory. And that's what the righteous life is. Set your mind on things above. Why? Why? Paul gives us the answer in verse, verse 3. He, he says this, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Like when you gave your life to Jesus, and you confessed your, needed, your need for a Savior because you had sin in your life, when you were washed in the waters of baptism, and, and you, you, lay, you were laid down in a watery grave, like when you rose to walk, you walked a new life. Paul said this, you died. You died. But then he says this, but your life, meaning this, that your new life in Jesus Christ is, is now hidden. Hidden doesn't necessarily mean concealed. Away forever. It means it's put in a place where it's safe and secure. It, it means that it's not just invisible. It just means that it's, there's a security that someday it will be revealed. And it's with Jesus Christ. You, you have not yet been glorified because Christ has not yet come back. You, you are, your life is hidden in him. And the hope of the church, listen, the hope of every single believer is in verse 4. It says this, that when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Like That's the hope of the church, isn't it? That those of us who have been buried and have risen to walk a new life have a life that's now hidden until he appears. And we, we should spend the rest of our days looking upward and looking forward to the day when Jesus appears. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You're waiting for the day when Jesus will appear. Aren't you? You're waiting for that. We, we should, like, there's no question that he's going to come. And when he does come, you will be with him in glory. Because, listen, you were with him when he died. United with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And someday you will be with him when he comes. But in the meantime, 
In, in the meantime, you're called to live this righteous life where you act on what you believe. Your words and your deeds line up. Your beliefs line up with your actions. And your mind is now set on the things that are above. And you, you, you live not to become righteous because God has already made you right in his eyes. Listen, Jesus didn't, or Jesus didn't give up on my friend Andrew. My, my friend Andrew figured it out. He went through a rough season. But he, he figured it out and he found his way back. And he, he, he no longer lives the divided life. He's still speaking at a church in another part of the country. And he's now figured out that he has to live this crucified life, this righteous life. That is hidden with Christ in God. And the same could be true for some of you. Some of you this morning have tried your whole time. Divided in how you live. I just want to encourage you to live this righteous life. And if you have yet to give your life to Jesus Christ in the way in which God lays it out in his word. Where you are laid down in the waters of baptism. And raised to walk this new life, this righteous life. I want to have that conversation with you. We would love to speak with you about that because we love you so much. On your way in, you were given a little piece of Jesus. Every week that we gather together as a church, we celebrate the, the death of the burial and the resurrection, the crucifixion of Jesus because Jesus asked us to do so and Man, this is one of those meals that we get to do together as a church. And that first layer is just this little piece of bread. And it represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken and beaten like we celebrated last Friday, a week ago Friday, that event, the crucifixion. Because a price had to be paid for the sins that we commit. And let's take this together as we remember Jesus. As you keep peeling that next layer back, you come to the representation or the symbol, symbol of the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. And I know that many of you who are longtime believers in Jesus, you, you don't take this lightly. And some of you, you're, you're very excited about this moment each and every week because we get to remember what Jesus has done. And I pray that as you take this today, you will do exactly that. That you have lived this righteous life anticipating the day that Jesus comes again. Let's take this. Let me pray for us today. Father God in heaven, I thank you for the way that your words just, just speak truth each and every, every time we look at them, every time we open them up. Father, they give us an understanding about our life and, God, this life that you, you called us to live. A life that your son lived. Father, you, you're asking us to live a life like his because you ask us to die a death like his. And, Father, because he lives, we get to live. And, Lord, we can't thank you enough for that. We look forward, so forward to eternity where we no longer have to walk on the, on the texture of this earth. But God, we get a soar in the heavens with you. We get to spread our wings and someday you will take us home. And Lord, we look forward to that. With eager anticipation, God, I ask that you come. But Father, don't come until all those who want to make the decision to follow you have made that decision. Father, I know that there are people in this room who are hesitant, they look at this righteous life and they think that's unattainable. God, it's not by their power, it's by yours. And I pray that as a church we could come alongside those that have given their life to you and we can raise them up, we can help them understand. Lord, give us the wisdom that we need to teach them how to live this life. 
Father, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Yes, sir. Like Joe said, living a righteous life can be a bit daunting, right? I can tell you personally, it gets way easier when Jesus has you by the hand. In fact, it's not possible without him. So if you have questions about that, you want to know what that looks like, how to get started, this church will help you, like Joe said. Just out these doors to the right is called the next room. It's glass enclosed room. There's folks in there that'll answer questions, pray with you. Maybe you're in the middle of it seeking it. Let us come alongside you and help and pray with you. Um, don't leave without stopping by. Um, two things, too, before you leave. First, Discover Valley View is being held every week from 10 to 1020 in the morning. Um, easy to find. It's in that same room right there in the next room. So that glass room in the morning. Um, it's a four-part series. It's a great way to get to know this church and this family. Um, you'll talk about things like our mission and our vision, um, the core beliefs of the church, what membership looks like. If you want to join this family, we'd love to have you, and volunteer opportunities. You will be amazed at how many ways there are that you can serve, can be part of this community, um, and grow your faith along the way. It's just not a better way to do it. So I hope you'll take a note of that. Registration's not needed. You can just jump in, just 10 o'clock, next room, next Sunday morning. Come on in, you can jump in at any time. If you've got little ones, there's a programming for them up to fifth grade. Older kids, welcome. Bring them along. Um, they can be part of that as well. So don't hesitate. There's no reason not to be part of it. Second thing we want to highlight is for the ladies here at the church. Hope you may know about it. If not, it's the IF Gathering um, 2024. It's just around the corner. Let's look at this video together. Get ready to be inspired, empowered, and have a blast at IF Gathering 2024. Join the women of Valley View for a replay of IF Gathering 2024 conference on Friday and Saturday, April 19th and 20th, right here at Valley View Christian Church. We'll learn together, we'll worship together, we'll watch sessions from celebrated teachers from around the country. So invite all your friends to join you and register today for the If Gathering 2024 at vvcc.org slash events or at the Get Connected booth on Sundays. Very good. Deanne's hair did good in that high wind. Couldn't tell what was going on. Didn't break her stride at all. She kept talking because you need to be part of this. Listen, ladies, you can actually register today. If you just go outside here before you leave at the Get Connected foyer, you can sign up. If you don't have time to do that, just go to vvcc.org backslash events and sign up. You will not be disappointed. It was a great Sunday, wasn't it? It was a great Sunday. Next Sunday is even going to be better, so you won't want to miss it. So make sure you're here. And this week, look for it. God's picked somebody out already for you that needs to hear your story. They're waiting for you. You just need to tell it. They need to hear the good news from someone just like you. So I hope you'll look for it. In fact, I'll tell you how you can make sure you don't miss it. If between now and next Sunday you do three things, you won't miss it. I bet you know what they are. And if you're new here, time to start learning because there's only three. They're super easy. Love Dallas. Live free. Thank you. And one more. Thank you very much. Love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Take rest, cause the living God is living in my chest. Every day I wake up feeling blessed, and even if I don't, I see it as a test. <laughs> cause I was lost until you found me. Now I know you're all around me. Nothing I could ever do to separate my love from you. You can just set us free. You can just set us free. You ain't drive me in that pit. Hey, nah, nah.
Saw my soul inside that fam and said that's it. Grace now. You never flake in the car winner. I just came to borrow with the gold winner. Fast forward, turn to a road runner. Spirit caught me here, go get it. Share blood, gave me lemonade on his cold bin. Pick me up. Always tell me turn up. Chasing at the Vicky on Took me to his fan and gave me peace and chose to cleanse me up Now I'm testifying of oh, your greatness, this a different look Go walk, oh, oh, like been hitting hard, let's take it slow oh, oh. Take a walk by the river and let you flow oh, oh. Cause Lord, you are all I ever want You are all I ever want Cause I was lost until you found me Now I know you're all around me Nothing I could ever do Y borró mi pasado tan doloroso, glorioso, maravilloso, por tu gracia rebozo de gozo. Me hiciste a tu semejanza, en ti yo he puesto toda mi confianza. Y castillo fuerte es mi esperanza, tú cambiaste mi lamento en danza. Y yo no sé qué fue lo que viviste, yo no sé, pero me redimiste. Yo solo sé que sé que no sé, que nueva vida me diste. Lo mejor que hice fue seguirte, un millón de versos quiero escribirte. Cómo no alabarte y bendecirte, mientras tenga vida voy a servirte.
amamos su presencia Jesús El regalo más hermoso Es tu presencia Cada día En la mañana Me abraza Tu fidelidad Y en la noche Me rodea Sé muy bien Que tú aquí estás me da vida en la noche y en el día que mire, a quien iré, tu presencia, mi refugio, mi escondite, mi escudo, a quien iré, a quien iré, soplas vida. Bye. 
presencia me da vida en la noche y en el día a quien iré a quien iré tu presencia mi refugio mi escondite mi escudo a quien a quien ¿Quién iremos? Si solo Él tiene palabras de vida eterna. ¡Lo aplaude fuerte!
There's still more to 